finally done it, Internet! My theories are finally complete! I've explored every inch of the Yu-Gi-Oh! fandom. Searched every corner of the wiki. Over a thousand anime episodes. Countless manga pages. Millions of pieces of the puzzle all coming together. And now, the complete Yu-Gi-Oh! Anime and Manga Timeline! Okay, here we go. Not the first to try his hand at this topic, probably not the last. Here's hoping I ain't the worst. The Yu-Gi-Oh! timeline is a bit of a mess. There are currently eight anime shows and, coincidentally, eight manga projects. The original Duel Monsters anime was adapted from the Duel Monsters manga, but none of the other series are adaptations. And the first three series of the anime all seem to take place in the same universe, but everything after that seems pretty self-contained. Sorta. So before I start to make heads or tails of this, I know that some of you are already running to the comments section to say that there is no overarching, interconnected Yu-Gi-Oh! continuity, that the show is just a series of 30-minute card commercials, and that I am wasting my time by talking about this. And if you're doing that, I have just one thing to say to you. That's boring. You're boring, everybody. Quit boring everyone! Okay, so we're gonna start with the first five anime shows. Yu-Gi-Oh!'s Duel Monsters, GX, 5Ds, Zexel, and Arc 5. And for the purposes of this theory, all of these shows take place one after the other in one mostly unbroken timeline. Duel Monsters happens, then GX, then 5Ds, then Zexel, then Arc 5. In Duel Monsters, we learn that the world used to be full of dark magics, and that sorcerers in ancient Egypt used this magic to play the shadow games, rituals that allowed them to bind and control the spirits of monsters. The shadow games brought the world to the brink of destruction, until an ancient pharaoh was forced to seal away the games to protect mankind from the threat that they represented. Millennia passed, and an archaeologist named Maximilian Pegasus discovered the historic remains of the shadow games while in a dig in Egypt. He was granted the Millennium Eye by the spirit guardian Shadi, and used it in order to produce and mass-market the Shadow Games as the modern game of Duel Monsters. This led to a renewed interest in Egyptian archaeology, which sent Solomon Moto searching through old tombs and crypts, until Solomon discovered the Millennium Puzzle, which he then gave to his grandson, Yugi. Upon solving the puzzle, Yugi unlocked the spirit of the ancient Egyptian pharaoh sealed within, and found that this spirit would come to his aid in times of great difficulty, and was particularly adept at helping him play the game of Duel Monsters. Yugi meets the Duel Monsters national champion, Seto Kaiba, who kidnaps Solomon in order to steal his incredibly rare Blue Eyes White Dragon card, which he proceeds to shred before their very eyes. Yugi challenges Kaiba to a revenge duel, which the spirit of the Millennium Puzzle helps him win by being the first player to ever successfully summon Exodia, the Forbidden One. This win attracts the attention of Maximilian Pegasus, who uses his Millennium Eye to imprison Solomon's soul away within a playing card, and coerces Yugi into competing in his upcoming Duelist Kingdom tournament. For corporate reasons, and to see his dead girlfriend again, but mostly corporate reasons. Yugi and the Pharaoh proceed to win Pegasus's competition, saving all of his victims and establishing Yugi as something of an international celebrity. Immediately following the end of the tournament, Kaiba returns home, only to find out that his company has been taken over by five members of its executive board, who proceed to trap him inside of a virtual reality simulation that Yugi and company have to rescue him from. His brother Mokubo was there, it was weird, believe it or not, this is going to be important later. After saving Kaiba, Yugi and the Pharaoh go on to compete in the Battle City Tournament, where the Pharaoh learns about his past as the ruler of Egypt, and that his powers are tethered to the spirits of the three Egyptian god monsters. The competition becomes a free-for-all power grab, as various factions attempt to use it as a front to collect all of the god cards and the powers of the Pharaoh for themselves. But when the dust settles, Yugi is left holding all three god cards and four of the Millennium Items. Oh, and there was this whole thing with Kaiba's other brother. That's sorta of gonna be important, too. The story basically hits pause while the gang does a side quest in Atlantis. Darts in the Seal of Orichalcos, the Legendary Dragons. That stuff all happens. It all counts. The Kaiba Corp Grand Prix. Yeah, that technically counts. And then the show wraps up with the Pharaoh and the Spirit of the Millennium Ring playing a shadow game in the memory world that ends with everything being... fine. 
the planet does not get destroyed, the good guys win, and after one last duel, Yugi and the Pharaoh finally part ways, with the Pharaoh departing for the land of the dead, while Yugi prepares to move on to adulthood. So that's point one on our timeline, Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters. Done. Next, we have Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, which takes place 10 years later when Yugi bumps into a kid named Jaden Yugi, who is late for his entrance examination at Kaiba's fancy duel school. Our old heroes just kinda got a feeling about this kid, and so he hands over his winged Karibo card and wishes Jaden luck. Jaden proceeds to win an examination duel that's been rigged against him in order to get into Duel Academy, and he ends up in the Slifer dorm, which is where students with the lowest grades and records are placed, but he still ends up being the best in his year anyways. In his first year, he stops a gang of duelists from getting their hands on the Sacred Beast cards, which could have potentially led to the end of the world. In his second year, he stops a fortune teller who is possessed by a psychic light from using a satellite to brainwash the entire planet. Don't ask, it doesn't make any more sense in context. Then in his third year, he meets a cute boy, goes dimension hopping with him, runs into his ex-girl card, watches all of his friends die, becomes a mass murderer, self-actualizes, patches things up with his ex, and goes on to save the world from the devil before having a for funsies duel in the past with Yugi. A bunch of other characters and locations from Duel Monsters show up, Kaiba actually owns the Duel Academy where Jaden and his friends go to school, and there's also this blink and you'll miss it throwaway reference to Yugi's old high school bully, Tetsu Trudge, in the show's last season. Pretty easy to place this show in the timeline just after Duel Monsters. Then comes Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds and the story of Yusei Fudo. It's pretty clear from the get-go that this is the same Yu-Gi-Oh! we've always known, but different. We're a little ways in the future, and our protagonist is an orphan who grew up in the Satellite, a junk town that is all that remains of Domino City, the primary setting of Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters and a reoccurring setting in Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. The upper class of society lives in New Domino City, where event duels are held in a state-of-the-art arena called the Kaiba Dome, again a reference to Yugi Moto's original rival. We also learn that Kaiba's company, the Kaiba Corporation, was responsible for reconstruction efforts after Domino was destroyed, and that they eventually developed dual runner technology for the sport of turbo dueling. Oh, and Yugi's old high school bully Trudge? He shows up again here too. Now he's a thuggish beat cop who starts off working for the bad guys, before he learns that friendship is the true meaning of card games on motorcycles. 5Ds definitely feels like the same world as Duel Monsters and GX, it's just aged up a little bit. The franchise has finished going through puberty, and now it's ready to save the world with a driver's license. But here's where things start to get weird. 5Ds is a time travel show, and most of the events we see actually take place in an altered version of history. We eventually learn that in the original version of time, Kaiba Corp developed a technology called Momentum, or NRD in the dub a sort of nuclear power plant that runs on the newly developed synchro summoning mechanic in the Duel Monsters card game. And this new synchro technology led to a golden age of prosperity on Earth, and everybody just played Yu-Gi-Oh all day while riding on their motorcycles, and everything was just perfect. But humanity didn't realize that using synchro monsters to run their power plants was affecting the evolution of the species. Momentum reactors were basically releasing dual monsters radiation across the planet, and people spent 200 years mutating because of it, becoming more cruel, selfish, and destructive. They kept pushing momentum technology further and further without realizing that Moment, the operating system running all the momentum tech on the planet, had become self-aware, which led to a classic man versus machine apocalyptic war called the Mechlord Genocides, which ended when all the momentum reactors on the planet exploded, wiping out both sides and leaving the war without a winner. However, there were four human survivors, Zone, Antinomy, Aporia, and Paradox. And these four scientists searched for a way to bring back humanity by changing the past, salvaging any functional human or mechlord technology that they could find in order to build a working time machine. And eventually, they succeeded and journeyed back in time. Okay, well actually, no. Technically, they all got old and died, but their consciousnesses were uploaded into android duplicates of themselves, and the androids are completely capable of feeling emotion and remembering the pain of mankind's end, so the androids went back in time, which feels like an unnecessary complication in the story, but whatever. In any event, that's the end of the original Yu-Gi-Oh! timeline. We've got Duel Monsters, and then GX, and then the Kaiba Corp releases momentum technology into the world, 200 years later, Moment becomes self-aware, there's a global man-versus-machine war, the reactors go kabloom, everybody dies, 
and four robots go back in time to try to fix it. That is the complete first Yu-Gi-Oh! timeline. It's a very sad story. But fortunately for everybody, this timeline gets completely overwritten. It doesn't exist anymore. After abandoning the year 2200 and something, the Zone, Antinomy, Paradox, and Aporia androids proceed to spend centuries rewriting history in various failed attempts at preventing the Mechlord genocides from ever happening. They founded a secret society known as Iliaster in order to reshape history over the course of millennia, and throughout 5Ds, we see Iliaster change history several times. But each time that they do, the present is rewritten to reflect its new past. When Paradox goes back in time to kill Dual Monsters creator Maximilian Pegasus, we watch Yusei's period in history begin to collapse as its relative past is altered. Yusei has to follow Paradox back in time and save Pegasus in order to prevent his world from being erased. This is important because the next show in the series, Yu-Gi-Oh! Zexel, or Zale if you prefer the original pronunciation, is where things start to get fuzzy. The story of Zexel follows Yuma Tsukumo as he bonds with an alien spirit creature named Astral, who is suffering from some card game related amnesia. The series focuses on the pair as they search for Astral's lost memories and later find themselves caught up in a war between Astral's homeworld and the invaders from Barian world. Unlike all the previous shows, Zexel doesn't go out of its way to draw a line back to its predecessors. There are no characters from Duel Monsters GX or 5Ds around. There are no subtle name drops or familiar locations, and all the new mechanics introduced in 5Ds, like synchro summoning and turbo dueling, are just gone. But there is suddenly this new mechanic called Exceed Summoning, which works yeah, kind of like synchro summoning, but you know, different. Plus, the show kind of feels like a soft reboot of Duel Monsters, with Yuma and Astral's relationship and final duel with one another closely mirroring the story of Yugi and the Pharaoh. Maybe this is the beginning of its own separate universe. But I genuinely don't think so. 5Ds went out of its way to establish that Yu-Gi-Oh!'s story existed on a single, rewritable timeline, so it would be weird for the next entry in the franchise to throw that out right away. And there are a lot of subtle clues connecting Zexel back to the original trilogy of Yu-Gi-Oh! shows. For example, the Fudo family from 5Ds promised us that momentum technology would lead to a venerable utopia for all of mankind which is exactly what Heartland City seems to be. Pollution and poverty are nowhere to be seen, automated systems take care of day-to-day -day affairs like sanitation and security, everybody seems to have ready access to all of the world's futuristic technology. This is the world that Yusei and his father dreamed of creating for mankind. And while the show never discusses the origins of Xyz summoning, there is some interesting lore from the real-world trading card game that fills in the gaps. The 2011 starter deck, Dawn of the Xyz, states that Xyz monsters are made from antimatter and arrived in Yuma's universe through a black hole. Which is an odd coincidence, since Yusei happens to witness the creation of a new black hole in the last few episodes of 5Ds and ends the series in possession of the device that Antinomy used to travel to that black hole. Plus, in Zexel, Heartland uses black holes as part of their sanitation department, shooting trash into space rather than letting it pile up on Earth. Throw in all the dual monsters and GX era monsters and symbols that show up in the Duel Lodge during Zexel's first season, and I think we've gone way past coincidence. There are just too many clues tethering this show back to the original three to ignore. Sure, enough time has passed that people aren't commonly discussing the events of the three previous shows, but their histories are very much ingrained into the world of Zexel. And personally, I think that the show is so much more interesting if you look at it in the context of its predecessors. For example, near the end of Zexel, we learn that the universe was created when a divine dragon willed it and all of life into existence, but that the effort of creating reality ultimately caused that dragon's body to die and its soul to crash land on Earth, flooding the planet with an energy known as chaos a power that has mostly disappeared by the time Zexel starts. But where did it go? Why did it disappear? Well, looking at it in the context of dual monsters, I'd say that Chaos is the power that the Pharaoh sealed away when he banished the Shadow Games from our world. Egyptian sorcerers were harnessing their Chaos to bind monster spirits to their will and nearly brought about the end of the world, which is why the Pharaoh was ultimately forced to seal that power away. Sure, you could still use existing Chaos items, like the Millennium items or the Shadow Charms, in order to initiate Shadow Games, 
but ordinary people lost the ability to just do magic once chaos was sealed away. Flash forward a few thousand years, and 5Ds ends with Yusei and the Signers preventing the end of the world, and with Yusei taking over the development of Project Moment for New Domino City. The show always framed synchro summoning and momentum reactors as an allegory for real-world nuclear energy, which currently holds the distinction of having the highest capacity factor of any non-theoretical energy source. But by the time of Zexel, the nuclear metaphor has been replaced by antimatter, which currently holds the distinction of having the highest capacity factor of any theoretical energy source, suggesting that nuclear synchro energy was phased out for safer and more efficient antimatter XCs reactors. And Zexel doesn't just tie a line back to the original three Yu-Gi-Oh! shows, it also sets up some pretty important plot points that future shows will tackle later. In Zexel, Yuma gets caught up in the renewed war between Astral World and Baryon World. Both sides race to get a hold of the Numeron Code, a dual monsters card containing the infinite power of the Creator Dragon, and the series ends with the character Astral using the Numeron Code to reunite Astral World and Baryon World an action that we're warned has allowed the power of chaos to return to Earth, and which will have grave consequences. A lot of fans have criticized the show for failing to explain what those consequences were, but I actually think we did get our answers in the very next show, Yu-Gi-Oh! Arc 5. Throughout this series, the main characters are constantly jumping back and forth between dimensions that correspond to the different summoning methods in the game. So there's a standard dimension, a fusion dimension, a synchro dimension, and an Xyz dimension and each one resembles the show and the time period in which that summoning method was mainly used. So there are a lot of familiar characters like Alexis Rhodes and Aster Phoenix in the Fusion Dimension, and most of them tie back to Duel Academy. Special cards and plot points from GX show up again here after years of being absent from the anime. And then the Synchro and Xyz Dimensions resemble 5Ds and Zexel in the same way. But then at the end of Arc 5, we learn that all of the different dimensions used to be a single, unified dimension. And that is when it all made sense. The original dimension that we see in flashbacks in Arc 5 is the continuity of all the shows prior to Arc 5. Dual Monsters, GX, 5Ds, and Zexel all happened in the original dimension. Everything from the Numeron Dragon creating the universe to Astral using the Numeron Code and inadvertently allowing Chaos Energy to return to mankind, that all happened in one timeline. But what happened next? Well, at the end of Arc 5, we learn about a duelist. A duelist who had no magical items or special technology, who fused with the spirit of his four ace monsters and threatened to destroy the world. A duelist named Zark. Zark is the consequence of Astral using the Numeron Code at the end of Yu-Gi-Oh! Zexel. By unsealing the power locked away by the Pharaoh, Astral set the stage for the end of the world. In the end, the battle against Zark grew so intense that reality itself split apart, causing it to reform as the four different dimensions. And this is the first and only point where the Yu-Gi-Oh! timeline actually splits. But it doesn't branch off at a single point like a normal time travel story. This is Yu-Gi-Oh! Of course it's much weirder than that. It actually splits into pieces, and each piece keeps on growing, creating four new timelines, all set during different periods in history but all happening at the same time. But why didn't history just happen the same way that it did last time? Why was the fusion dimension so different from what we saw in GX? And the same goes for the other three. Well, there are three big reasons. The first is that there seem to be some characters noticeably absent from their respective time periods. Where are Yugi, Jaden, Yusei, and Yuma in the new dimensions? These were major players in history, and they're all just gone. Secondly, on the day that the new dimensions were created, two new babies were born in each one that had not existed in the original timeline. Yuya Sakaki and Zuzu Boyle were born in the Standard Dimension, Yuri and Selina in the Fusion Dimension, Yugo and Rin in Synchro, and Yuto and Lulu in the Xyz Dimension. These four boys were reincarnations of Zark, with each child possessing a fraction of his soul, while the girls were reincarnations of Rei, the duelist who finally defeated Zark before reality split. And of course, the third and most obvious reason that the Dimensions ended up being different is that Arc 5 antagonist Leo Akaba derailed history when he started jumping between dimensions and starting wars. For all intents and purposes, Leo Akaba is a time travel from the future, who jumped back and forth between the different dimensions and their different periods in history, bringing new technology with him. Where the standard dimension started out with nothing but the original Kaiba Corp era dual discs, 
Leo Akaba used his knowledge of the future in order to create his Solid Vision dual discs. This pollution of history caused things to play out in a fundamentally different way, where the Fusion Synchro and Xyz dimensions are fundamentally unrecognizable from their original versions of history. The plot of Arc 5 sees Zark reunite all the lost pieces of his spirit in order to resurrect himself, only to be thwarted by the heroes from all four dimensions and his old foe Rey. This jumbles up reality again, causing the standard dimension to be recreated as the Pendulum Dimension, and Zark's essence is trapped and later purified in a baby. It's a little weird. And that, my fellow duelists, is the complete Yu-Gi-Oh! anime timeline. A magic dragon created the universe and cried itself to death, its tears gave magic to the earth, people spent a few thousand years playing cards with one another until time exploded, then one guy started an interdimensional war and blew time up again, which was ultimately fine because an evil baby smiled. It's a beautiful, wonderful series, and anyone who says otherwise is wrong. And as ridiculous as that description was, I feel like these clues fit together well enough that this may have actually been intentional on someone's part on the writing team. We'll never know. Konami has long since made it clear that they don't want to be bothered with an ever-expanding continuity, and now that the anime is being produced by an entirely different studio, who knows what rights to what characters are jumbled up where. But I like to believe that there was one die-hard fan of the show on the staff who was like, NO! I WILL MAKE SURE THERE'S ONE INTERCONNECTED CONTINUITY! Or is that just me? WHY AREN'T YOU PAYING ME FOR THIS, KONAMI?! So, that is a connected timeline for the dual monsters through Arc 5 animes. But to include Brains, Sevens, Go Rush, and the various manga projects, we're going to have to move from a mildly compelling game of Connect the Dots to some leap of logic speculation. The story of Playmaker and the Link Brain simulation is a weird one to fit into the series chronology. And after more research on the subject than I care to admit, I found one small detail. A tiny clue, one crumb of information that has me absolutely convinced that it does. Reveal! Trap card! Dimensional Barrier! <laughs> Alright, let me explain. Dimensional Barrier is a trap card first released in the Arc 5 era booster pack, Invasion Vengeance. Its effect allows the user to declare a type of monster and negate the summoning and effects of that type of monster for the rest of the turn. Most importantly, the allowable monster types are Fusion, Synchro, Xyz, Pendulum, and Ritual implying that Ritual Energy was mostly isolated to one little dimension of its own alongside the rest of the summoning powers. But even if we accept this card that's never appeared in the anime at face value, how do we get from a Ritual Dimension Exists to Playmakers playing in the Ritual Dimension? Well, to start, there's simple process of elimination. Vrains just doesn't seem to fit with any of the dimensions established in Arc 5, with the technology seen throughout the show appearing to be both more sophisticated in some areas but less in others, suggesting that industrial development occurred on a completely separate track from those worlds seen previously. Even the game of Duel Monsters has regressed. In the first five series, duelists wishing to perform Fusion, Synchro, and Xyz summoning were able to do so relatively uninhibited, so long as they had the necessary cards to pull it off. But Vrains introduced some pretty specific limitations on advanced summoning, Namely, that players couldn't summon more than one Fusion, Synchro, or Xyz monster without the aid of newly introduced Link monsters. Why? Well, it makes sense when you consider this in terms of energy. In Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds, we learn that dueling energy, or NRD as they call it in the dub, is a measurable phenomenon, something which Arc 5 reaffirms when the Leo Corporation begins covertly tracking duelists by monitoring the power output their cards generate when played. And while duelists are able to perform each summoning method in any dimension, it is suggested that each type of energy is limited outside of its home dimension, meaning that fusion energy, and therefore the ability to fusion summon, probably has some limits outside of the fusion dimension. Ditto for Synchro and Xyz. Enter Link Monsters. Playmaker and the other Link Brains duelists frequently refer to the process of Link summoning as the closing of a circuit, which is important because of how they facilitate the use of extra deck monsters. An electrical circuit is simply an interconnection network that creates a path for an electrical current. Or, put simply, a circuit conducts energy from point A to point B. 
While there might be a deficit of fusion, synchro, and exceeds energy in the network of link brains, duelists can pass more readily available power through their link monsters and onto their other advanced monsters. But what's the one advanced monster type that doesn't require a link monster to come onto the main monster field? Ritual monsters. There is no restriction on ritual summoning, and Vrains represented something of a ritual renaissance for the franchise. The show features several instances of ritual summoning, the most of any series since the original Duel Monsters, 33 of the 114 ritual monsters in the game, or just under 30%, were released during the show's first run in Japan, and the Link Monster card art looks kind of like Ritual Summoning's edgelord younger brother, which kind of makes sense. After all, what is a Link Monster? It's a computer program. We see Playmaker assemble them by manipulating data storms throughout the series, and his series of Talker Ace Monsters are all based on programming protocols. But what is a program? It's a repeatable series of processes that perform a specific task. And what's a ritual? Archaeologically speaking, it's a series of processes that perform a specific task. Sacrifice 99 villagers and you get 7 millennium items. Tribute a Karibo to a fierce knight and you get a blackluster soldier. Compile 4 sub-programs and you get a firewall dragon. Intelligent enough machines can digitally replicate ritualistic behavior. And suddenly, Link Vrains has the ability to source out additional power for the anemic summoning methods. Speaking of Link monsters, the show's first season doesn't feature any advanced summoning mechanics other than Link summoning. But right off the bat in episode 2 of season 2, Playmaker performs the show's first non-Link special summoning. And who does he call forth? The Dark Magician-inspired ritual monster, Cyburst Magician. A few episodes later, we meet Soulburner's Salaman Great Emerald Eagle before seeing Cyber's Magician again. This means ritual monsters beat Fusion, Synchro, and Xyz monsters to the screen not one, not two, but three times in this particular series. But there is a hole in our theory. The other four dimensions each resemble a specific period in history, a period where their preferred summoning method was at its height, meaning that a ritual dimension should theoretically exist when ritual summoning was at its peak. But when was Ritual Summoning at its height? Well, we don't really know, but we see the most instances of Ritual Summoning during the Duel Monsters era of the show, particularly during the Duelist Kingdom and pre-Battle City arcs, suggesting that a Ritual Dimension would likely be centered around this period, similar to the world we saw in the original anime, but different. And wouldn't you know, we've already seen a world that's similar to the original anime, but different. In the film Dark Side of Dimensions, we see Kaiba unveil a new boss monster, the ritual-based Blue-Eyes Chaos Max Dragon. Moreover, the film's antagonist, Aigami, introduces a brand new, never-before-seen summoning method, the curiously named Dimension Summoning Method. But the most important thing to take note of in this film are the new dual discs that Kaiba unveils during the movie blue hologram projectors that store card data as software so that duelists no longer require physical cards to play the game. These dual discs are functionally identical to the ones seen across Link Brains. Soul Technologies is widely distributing the technology that Seto Kaiba invented, implying that Vrains takes place after Darkseid. They exist on a single timeline a timeline when this portion of history split off and became the Ritual Dimension, and where history played out differently from what we saw in the original series. Sure, things are similar. There's a Yugi and a Kaiba who were rivals and who saved the world. But this Yugi and this Kaiba are not the same as this Yugi and this Kaiba. They're actually the same as this Yugi and Kaiba. Yu-Gi-Oh! creator Kazuki Takahashi, who served as the film's sole credited screenwriter, has definitively stated that the movie serves as a sequel to his original manga and not the animated series produced by Studio Gallop. For anime-only fans, this is why Kaiba seems to have forgotten being present for the ceremonial duel between Yugi and Atem. In the manga, he wasn't there. Kaiba disappeared after the Battle City arc and remained absent until the Dark Side prequel special, Transcend Game. And that, fellow duelists, brings us to the crux of this theory. Today, I propose that the Ritual Dimension is no more than the Yu-Gi-Oh! manga timeline, 
a version of history that was created after the rise of the Supreme King Zark and the fall of the original dimension. As the dimension set in the earliest period in history, and with no Zark fragments running around to fundamentally alter the course of events, this timeline would have continued on, moving into a GX era, then a 5Ds, then on to a Zexel, before reaching a new version of the Arc 5 period, where Zark never rose to power, allowing history to move on to the era of Link Vrains. And this theory is given weight by the fact that Yu-Gi-Oh! Vrains is the first and only Yu-Gi-Oh! series not to feature a companion manga, with the print version skipping it entirely in favor of publishing an adaptation of Yu-Gi-Oh! 7s instead. But why would we need a manga if this is, in reality, the story of the manga? But for those of you who are familiar with the manga versions of these stories, you might well be asking yourself why the stories presented in print are so different from the ones seen on screen. After all, the GX manga also tells the story of Jade and Yuki's first year at Duel Academy, but rather than facing off against the Shadow Riders and the Sacred Beasts, Jaden is forced to contend with the dual spirit Tragadia, a creature whose Ka was created from a survivor of the massacre that created the Millennium Items. The 5D's manga doesn't feature Zone's apocalyptic future or time travel elements, but instead sees Yusei Fudo face off against the Goodwin Brothers to prevent the Festival of Destiny, an ancient ritual used to resurrect the ultimate god. And Arc 5 is a time travel story that sees hero from the future, Yuya Sakaki, come back in time to seduce his own grandmother. Yeah, not making that up. But why? Why are the stories and narratives in the ritual dimension so different from the ones seen in the original dimension? Well, it all comes down to one small change for one character. Kaiba. In the original dimension, Seto Kaiba was present for the ceremonial duel between Yugi and the Pharaoh. He witnessed the Pharaoh bring out all three Egyptian god cards, the power that Kaiba himself had sought, and the Pharaoh still lost to Yugi. Kaiba's rivalry with the Pharaoh was put to rest because he saw for himself that Yugi was the true king of games. But in the ritual dimension, that never happened. Kaiba wasn't present for the final duel of the story. He didn't set foot into the Pharaoh's tomb until the events of Darkseid. His rivalry with the Pharaoh was never given closure, and so he began to obsessively search for a way to bring Atem back from the land of the dead. Where his anime counterpart moved on with his life and began projects in space exploration and renewable energy, the manga Kaiba dedicated himself to getting his final rematch with his lost rival. And at the end of Dark Side of Dimensions, we see him hurl himself into the land of the dead. To me, this scene always read as though Kaiba knew that this would be a one-way trip. When his little brother worried that he might not come back, Kaiba evaded the subject and left everything in Mokuba's hands. When he reaches the afterlife, his body began to dissolve as he abandoned his crashed dimension ship. Seto Kaiba was willing to die if it meant proving to himself that he really was the best of the best, and his death would have changed everything we know about the story of Yu-Gi-Oh! after Duel Monsters. Who orchestrated the events of the GX and 5Ds animes? Seto Kaiba. He founded the Duel Academy to study the mysteries surrounding the game of Duel Monsters, and had a direct hand in multiple aspects of the Light of Destruction and Dark Dimension storylines. The Kaiba Corporation was responsible for momentum, the destruction of Domino City, and the construction of New Domino City. But what if Kaiba had never been there? Would any of those stories have taken place? Probably not. Adventurers like Jaden Yuki and Yusei Fudo would still have been drawn to greatness, going out and forging their own stories regardless of the circumstances around them. But without Kaiba there to kick off the events that shaped their lives, the journeys they found themselves on would have been entirely different. Yu-Gi-Oh! Zexel, a story where Kaiba's influence is much less pronounced, is coincidentally the only manga adaptation that retains the same core plot as its anime counterpart. And of course, the events of Arc 5 would have been completely different, as this is a dimension where Zark was never born, meaning that the Yuya, Yuto, Yugo, and Yuri seen within the events of the Arc 5 manga would be natural-born humans, free from the corruption of Zark's influence, and born as brothers within a single dimension, because the ritual dimension never repeated the events that caused the original dimension to divide in the first place. In many ways, this world is what the original dimension should have been, a single, unbroken universe that carries on where its predecessor failed. 
But what about Yu-Gi-Oh! Sevens and Go Rush, you might be asking? Well, from the first episode of Sevens, I think it's pretty obvious that this show takes place after Reigns. In the premiere episode, protagonist Yuga Odo creates the new Rush Duel format, as he felt that the game had become too structured and restricted, mirroring the sentiments that fans all over the world had about the Master Rules format implemented during the Vrains era of the game. After Yuga accidentally forced the world to adopt the Rush Duel format, the Link Vrains simulation would have been incompatible and fallen out of prevalence. Then comes Yu-Gi-Oh! Go Rush, which is a direct sequel to Sevens. Main characters Yui and Yuamu Oga are related to Yuga, and the world is still utilizing Yuga's Rush Duel format. And where the franchise goes from here? I guess we're just gonna have to wait and see what comes with time. Time is a strange thing. It's been almost three years since I started making Yu-Gi-Oh! videos. Those of you who follow my channel have probably noticed that I haven't uploaded much content this year. Back in January, I was bombarded with a series of copyright attacks by NAS, the company that produced Yu-Gi-Oh! up until 2019. I wasn't the only channel to be hit. Dylan from Yu-Gi-Oh! Everything and a few others were targeted as well, despite the fact that all of our content satisfies the requirements of fair use. Most of us have contested these claims, and I believe that most of the content has been restored. But the whole thing has left a bad taste in my mouth. YouTubers like us help to grow the Yu-Gi-Oh! brand. We keep fans engaged between releases and attract old fans back. I can't tell you how many people have reached out to me to say, I stopped watching after 5Ds, but your videos made me want to go back and watch the other shows. And to see my business and the businesses of my fellow YouTubers be targeted in this way, it was really hurtful. So making this video was much harder than it should have been. And between that, some personal changes in my life, and the loss of series creator Kazuki Takahashi, I think I'm ready to be done for a while. This isn't the end of the channel. I do intend to start making videos across a wide variety of franchises. I hope you'll all join me in the next chapter of this channel. But if you were just here for the Yu-Gi-Oh, thanks for the good times. It has truly been one of the greatest artistic pleasures of my career, making videos for you. If you do plan on sticking around, why don't you let me know what franchises I should overanalyze next in the comments below. Then, hit the subscribe thing to see if I do it. Everybody stay safe and stay healthy, and I will catch you in the next video. Bye!